Hello, hello. 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 So nice. <laughs> so nice to be back. This is my first yeah. podcast of the year and I'm so, so excited. I have the beautiful Amy Taylor joining us today. Hello. So nice to hello. be here. <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited. So Amy actually scheduled in to do the podcast last year or we'd started talking about it, yeah. but um, you're so divine. You, I'm, you wrote on your form. I'm in no rush. I know there's so many women that need to share their story because you're just so sweet. That's the kind of person you are. Um, So I want to give a little bit of background. So Amy, um, do you you still go to Hope? Yeah. 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 So I actually used to go to a church on the Central Coast many years ago down, um, it was called Hope UC, and I actually Mm -hmm. love that church so much. it's such a beautiful space and I've always said it, um, you know, they actually do grief and loss really well mm. for a strange thing to say. But, you know, I just always remember being there for like Mother's Days and Father's Days. And even if you haven't lost that person, um, totally off topic, but I have like, you know, such an estranged relationship with my family. And I just always mm. felt like Darlene did those kind of um, days yeah. really well. But so I, so I, I didn't know Amy and her husband, Luke, but I had always seen them around church. And I remembered years ago, um, that they, they were pregnant and then they lost their baby and I was a mutual friend with a friend of theirs. And so I just kind of heard of their story. And then I, all of a sudden, lo and behold, three years later, I'm in mm-hmm. hospital and I'm about to lose Millie. And I just remember thinking, I need to chat to that girl that lost the baby. I couldn't even think of your name. And I was like, I'm racking my brain. And and I messaged my friend Danielle and I said, who was your friend that lost the baby? I need to speak to her. And Mm. she gave me your details and I had, you know, we were friends on Facebook, but I just, you know, my brain wasn't working. And I, and I, and so for everyone listening, I messaged Amy and I just said, and I still remember walking up the hallway messaging you. Like I remember the moment I messaged you, I was walking, walking, I was walking out of Niku and I was walking up the hallway to go meet with Dylan and I had just been told that I wasn't taking Millie home that day and I just wrote I was just like hey Amy uh, like I just found out I'm not bringing my baby home how do I breathe Mm. and I just remember you replying straight away which was such a blessing I was like oh my god she's (laughs) online and you did you know you were like you wrote a lot and I just remember it was like you know breathe uh hold Mm. her and smell Mm. her and take her in and remember the weight of her on your chest and Mm. you sent me songs to listen to I know and it was just it was so crazy that in such a moment I thought of you and the reason I thought of you is because I remember years ago when you guys lost Lawson and I remember hearing the story and then I remember seeing you at church on stage and I've told this story so many times that people are going to be like, oh, this is the girl she's talking about. <laughs> I remember like seeing you guys. And, you know, I remember, uh, do you sing on stage or is it just Luke? I don't, just Luke. Yeah, you just don't. Luke. So I must have seen Luke on stage and I'm like, this guy is on stage worshipping God and mm. his child died. Like, you know, I just yeah. didn't, I, I didn't get it. And yeah. then, and I remembered hearing you guys were so faithful in the hospital and so gracious. And then, you know, then we experienced it and we had the same feedback, you know, we were so kind and so gracious and all those things. Mm. It's like, wow. I mean, you have two choices when you're in the hospital, you can be awful yeah. and angry and, and there's, there's no right or wrong, you know, when no. the moments of grief that these things happen, That's it. but we yeah. were very gracious and we were praying a lot and we were worshiping and we had all those things. Mm. So, uh, and I know that I've, you've been so amazing to reach out to since because, um, you know, I c- constantly message you like, okay, I'm really angry at God this yeah. week. Like, how, how did you deal with this? And I just, yeah, I, I look up to you guys. That's such a weird <laughs> thing to say, but I do, you know, and no. I just yeah. really am appreciative of you. Yeah. I remember when I got your message, I saw it pop up and I was, I'd just gotten in the car and I was like, I just need to get home before I open this because I know it's, going to be big from the start Mm. of just the words I could see and um wow I just remember like that like just takes you straight back to the moment like to to my loss and just the that intense grief in that yeah my Mm. my heart was so broken for you and as you mentioned in your Mm. post I reached out to another friend who lost a baby and was like ah I'm broken I'm broken for you for my friend and well we didn't actually really know each other but we were Facebook friends. No, <laughs> um, I know, yeah, no. right? How funny. 
but yeah, my heart's broken for you. And I'm, I was, you know, glad to be able to give what helped for me in that time. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so I met Amy just a couple of days ago on the Central Coast. I just tried to organize a bit of a coffee catch up to, yes. to meet whoever was there. And it was so nice. And, and I was telling with this other girl, Hannah, and I said, I reached out to Amy when I found out I was losing Millie. And then Amy said, well, I actually reached out to Hannah and said, this girl's <laughs> just messaged me. You know, And it's just so, but I loved that as well, because I was like, wow, I didn't even realize in that moment that I was putting my grief onto you. And mm, that so, was going to bring no, up something yeah. for you, yeah. and then you got, you know, and and then yeah. you had to go to somebody else, and it's just, it's, it is the shittest club, but we have the best yeah. people in it. Like, yeah, it's I think just it shows, so, yeah, and it shows why it's so important to have these people in your life um, that get it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I loved our little coffee, and I think mm. the other day that coffee and chat with you guys was the first time I've. Um, I, I cry all the time on the podcast and I cry for people, but I just like, it was really deep the other day, like seeing mm. photos and, and seeing babies, like to meet yeah. the girls who had had twins, but lost one and one survived. Yeah. That's like, just, it's just this wild world. And we just have never know all the different depths of it. Hey. Yeah. It's wild. <laughs> it's not fair. Yeah. It's not at all. So, yeah, if anyone is listening from around the Central Coast or knows anyone that has lost, Amy does run a really beautiful group there and um, mm -hmm. I love what you guys have created and I do hope to do the same up here. I think it's mm -hmm. super important and, yeah, it's lovely. Yeah, it's really special to have each so other. Let <laughs> so let's get into your story. Yes. Um, I've been going back and listening to the podcast lately and I really love this question. I think it's super powerful to kind of learn learn about who the person is um so the day we lose our child we change like mm. from our dna our souls change everything about us changes so who was amy taylor before she lost her baby i well as you know i go to church so i was a follower of jesus um a wife yeah. a daughter a friend um i was working as an occupational therapist with uh, kids who have pretty much been through what um, our babies have been through but survived. Um, so I was working wow. with kids, adults, um, you know, babies uh, that had lifelong disabilities because of a traumatic birth situation. Um, no so I was doing that way. before. Yeah, and still kind of am a little bit different um, area now but I was working with mainly kids with cerebral palsy so yeah and um yeah, I right. definitely oh, yeah, just, have yeah. been changed from the inside out so <laughs> I am 100% a different person exactly as you said now um for mm, yeah. a, in a good way as well so yeah somebody said that to me the other day they said broken is not bad and I was like yes. wow that's such a good way of putting it and I feel like lately whilst I've been quite angry, I've mm -hmm. found this angry version of myself, um, I'm trying to turn my pain and passion into a purpose, which is very, very yeah. cliche. But no. <laughs> I do have this like newfound grit about me, like that I'm like, you yeah. know what, I actually really like this version of me. Yeah. Um, That's beautiful. Yeah. And we were saying the other day at coffee, like we do change and we do become these different people, but I think there is this, beauty about us as well like because yeah. we just become different people but a different version and my therapist was actually saying the other day that kindness is sometimes a trauma response where we don't want to um upset the apple cart basically mm -hmm. and I feel like grief brings out the kind we can still be kind <laughs> but yeah. there's just this like grit of like you know what, I've got this other side of me now and not, and I feel like nothing is ever going to hurt me like losing my child no. did. So you yep. kind of, yeah, you get this like, ugh. Exactly. No, that's exactly right. So random question, this might sound really silly. So is cerebral palsy only ever a birth injury? It was typically, it's like a, a, a stroke essentially. So where there's been a cutoff wow. to the, the brain. Um yeah, I could talk about that for a long time, but 
<laughs> yeah, well, because it was it was almost one of Millie's diagnoses, yeah. but I didn't understand what I meant. I just heard of cerebral palsy, and you just know what it kind of looks like typically, but yeah. I didn't realize that it's yeah okay. Yeah, okay, well, cool. actually, That's like super in, interesting. I think someone spoke about CMV in one of your podcasts recently, and mm-hmm. that's a, um, a risk factor for um, cerebral palsy as well. Wow. Yeah. In utero only? Yeah. Like would they have cut? So, so there's a girl that follows me on Instagram and I talk to her all the time. Her baby has CMV and mm-hmm. is living, but they're unsure of the risks. A lot of it is deafness, I think, so hearing mm-hmm. impairment. Yep. yep. Would she have already had cerebral palsy by now? Would she have had that at birth or it can't be developed later? Oh, I don't I, – well, I would say that she um, – so your friend hasn't had the baby yet, is that what you're saying? Um, no, this girl on Instagram has had her child and she's a yeah. couple of years old now. She yeah. had CMV. Yeah, yeah. You would, she would know by now if there was a – sure. if they were okay. at risk. So typically she would probably have been born at risk of cerebral palsy and then mm-hmm. not um, – yeah, was born. If everything okay, was developing okay. normal. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's an interesting world. So interesting. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And so, are you still doing it a little bit? Did you say, or was um, it hard I, to go back into that space once Lawson passed away? It, I didn't find it as hard as I expected, um, but I have since like gone out as a sole trader just so that I can be at home with my daughter a little bit more. Um, and I mainly have an okay. autistic caseload rather than a physical disability caseload okay so it's kind of just what's more needed out in the moment (laughs) yeah interesting oh you're a clever little chook aren't you (laughs) (laughs) i love that and so yeah so you have a a little girl now and we'll talk about banksy in a little bit but Mm. let's go back to your conception of Mm -hmm. lawson so was falling pregnant easy for you guys yeah, so we started, we saw a naturopath nine months before um, trying um, just to get everything checked and sorted and I went on a regime with her and then so about nine months later yeah. we started trying and fell like relatively easily. It was probably like four months of trying and then we fell pregnant with him yeah. um, and was like totally shocked um, that it had happened so quickly because I don't know, I was just anticipating it to happen longer and um I told yeah. I told Luke on he I found out on a Sunday morning and Luke had left for church already and so then I had to like wait through the church service and like look at him being like oh my gosh uh-huh. you're gonna be a dad and like you have no idea and I know and then I told him when we got home mm. but um yeah we were both so excited and um pregnancy was uh like a textbook perfect pregnancy um I had scans at like seven weeks to do a dating scan 12 weeks and 20 weeks I actually also had a gender reveal yep. scan in there somewhere I think it was about 15 weeks um, we went to just a private person yep. to find out uh, what gender the baby was and here's a little boy yeah um, which mm. Luke was like very relieved in the video of us opening the thing to find out he literally says Phew. I'm like oh my gosh Luke I'm actually thinking it was a girl <laughs> You can't do that. <laughs> was he just nervous to have a daughter? Oh, I think he just always pictured that he would, ha- like, he's a firstborn son, so he would have a firstborn mm. son. So he had this, like, dream mm. in his mind of what it would look like. And so, um, and he still had a firstborn son. Mm-hmm. So we still acknowledge that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, anyway, yeah. obviously now he wouldn't change that thinks he's a girl. He is obsessed with her. But I think, yeah, yeah he just, he kind of yeah. knew what had that expectation in his mind um so we found out that he was a boy um and yeah all the scans were perfect I remember in the 20 week scan they were laughing at him like saying he's so energetic and he's playing with his little willy (laughs) um and (laughs) and so yeah they like everything was really beautiful I had um a beautiful midwife um she's the same age as me Mm -hmm. so I think I don't remember how old I was then 26 um so mm-hmm. so a young midwife and um we were, I was doing uh like continuity of care like it I think I had two midwives but one main midwife so I had a lot of uh support and trust with her and um we had done a hypnobirthing course uh Luke and I yeah 
Um, and so we were really excited to kind of have like a low intervention, go with the flow type pregnancy yeah. at birth and labour and definitely had all those in, strategies. In, in the hospital? Yeah, in the hospital. Um, and so the midwife yep. was super supportive of that in like, you know, keeping the room dim and um, as little checks as possible, that kind of thing was what I really wanted. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so I it was also covid like lockdown when okay. um, I was pregnant. So majority of my pregnancy yeah. was like spent at home. <laughs> um, I did lots of like okay. long, long walks because that's kind of all we could do in our LGA. Is that what it was called? LGA local yeah. area. Um, local gov- yeah. yeah. <laughs> that thing. Did lots of walks and um, yeah, working from home. So I re- feel like I rested a lot during Lawson's pregnancy. Um, yeah. And yeah, wasn't, like not many people actually got to see me pregnant because we were in lockdown up until like the couple of weeks before he was born. Um, and yeah, no, like nothing was really. So what, date, what date would that have been? When is this? Twenty twenty or twenty twenty one? Twenty twenty one, November. Yeah. He was born early November, twenty twenty one. Yeah. So I think at about the only thing that I can like remember being not great or not even not great. Like I wasn't even really sick in his pregnancy, like just a little bit, but nothing like I thought it would be. About 37 yeah. weeks, I think it was, I'd gone for a, quite a big walk and I got home and I had a little bit of spotting in my underwear. And so I called the midwife and the midwife was like, oh, like pop on a, pla- a pad and if you have any more spotting, then come into the hospital. And I didn't have any more spotting, okay. so I didn't do anything about it. And that could have been nothing, but it was okay. one of those things that weighed yeah. on my mind um, afterwards. Like, oh, if I had have gone, maybe they would have noticed, you know, as it all is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So then Fire. I, do you want me to keep going into like. Yeah, the, please. You know, like yeah. the labor stuff. So. I'm in. I'm in. I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, I, on Lawson's due date, um, which was the 7th of November, we went to church mm-hmm. in the morning and um, like just feeling really normal. Uh, that night I decided to stay home from church because we had a night service and Luke went to church. Um, and then um, at about midnight that night I woke up to having some contractions um, and kind of happened pretty quickly I think. Like they were about every 15 minutes apart. So I was just trying to sleep in between the contractions um, until they got a bit closer together. And about 5 a.m. I woke Luke up and was like, we're having a baby. Hun, this is getting a bit intense. I need your help. I'd like to go have a shower. Wow. So we went upstairs to have a shower. But mind you, I also, um, right before going upstairs, we were actually living with my grandparents at that point in time because our house was being built. Um, and so we were oh, hoping yeah. it would be finished. Yeah. <laughs> we were hoping it would be finished before Lawson yes. was born, but it, it wasn't. Um, so... I ran into the laundry and threw up everywhere and I just left it there for my nan to deal with, poor thing, <laughs> because I was just the pain. Sorry, the, nan. Yeah. <laughs> pain of the contractions was too much and then went up to the shower, had a shower. Wow. Um, then threw up again and at that point we were like, oh, let's call the midwife and see. Um, on the phone, the midwife was like, oh, is you that normal? Like- is, is- yeah. Well, yeah, like to okay. wait. Wow. Of the vomiting. No, to, to vomit. Yeah. Oh, I <laughs> I've never been in labour. I didn't have a Banksy, but I think so. Yeah, it okay. is, it was When it gets to the, like, nitty-gritty bit, it's quite painful. So, um, Oh, I bet. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I yep. don't know if it's normal. Yep. I well, wasn't expecting I get, it. Yeah. And I'm not a vomiter, so I was like, yeah, well, yeah. yeah. I was expecting that I would if we laboured yeah. because I vom- I vomited my entire pregnancy. <laughs> so for me, I was like, I will be vomiting Normal. until she yeah. comes out. Like, you know, right? Yeah. yeah. So different, wow. but also different. And so you vomited out of the pain? Like yes. you, it was like the yeah. intensity of pain. Wow. Yeah. Um, so called my midwife. She was like, oh, you seem like you're doing really well, like labouring at home. Do you want to stay at home for a little bit longer? I was like, oh okay in my head I'm thinking I don't feel like I'm doing well like this is intense yeah um so I stayed at home so that was about six I labored for another hour or maybe two hours 
I called my mum to come at that point as well because I was like, I think we're going to go to the hospital soon. Um, and we had just gotten an exemption that morning to have my mum there because of COVID, you could only have one person. Um, oh, so we, good. We had an exemption, yeah. so thank goodness my mum was able to come. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, we then made our way, called the hospital at about eight, was like, I need to come in, made our way to hospital, and I think got there some time around 9 30, 10 o'clock. Um, I was like hypnobirthing. So I had headphones on with blindfold <laughs> to try and like keep myself in the zone. <laughs> I didn't want to see where I was going. Love the vision. <laughs> wow. Um, I've and so not then, heard this. Oh, uh, it was, it's funny. It kept me like, it kept me going like my labor. Cause often they say that when you go to hospital, your labor can slow down or your contractions can kind of slow down. Okay. But that didn't really happen for me, which is nice. I um, then was Mm -hmm. having so many contractions, it took so long to get from the car into the hospital. So I got a wheelchair, um, wheeled up to the room. And my midwife, she'd put some little like fake tea light candles and the lights were dim and the bath was full. Um, So Mm. that was kind of what I had asked for. So she was beautiful. Um, Lawson Mm. was... um, his heart rate was assessed when we got to hospital. So I didn't have the CTG, like the monitors on the belly. I just okay. had um, the Doppler, intermittent Doppler yep. monitoring for And him. that was something that you had requested? Yeah. Yeah. I was happy to have the um, yep. monitors if it, there was something that made it seem war- warranted, but um, I felt like they it could have made intervention that wasn't necessary. Obviously, okay. <laughs> take that all back now because there was intervention that was necessary, but it was all picked up with the Doppler anyway. So she was checking after every contraction okay. and in between contractions with the Doppler, his heart rate. Um, and on yeah. arrival, he had a really strong heartbeat. I think it was 130, something like that, with um, the accelerations and decelerations, which is what they're looking for, for a healthy um, heartbeat. So okay. it was all good. I um, hopped in the bath um, and was labouring really well in there. Um, And I think not long after just having his heart rate checked again and it was all good, I had felt like a big, um, like a a pop but not like huge. So like I just felt something weird in my belly, like a pop. And um, when I looked down in the water, there was like a – a gush of like bright red blood in the water and I didn't think that was anything wrong I was kind of just like oh okay like something's happening baby's coming Um, yeah yeah yeah. um in the in the report later they described they said approximately 30 mils of blood at that point in time okay so not Um, a whole lot yeah not huge amount the midwife then said to me oh did you feel something then um and I was like yeah I felt some like a strange pop um, she's like okay and she checked the heart rate and at that point in time the heart rate had gone down to uh, I think about 90 or 100 um, so the midwife asked me to change positions so I went from like a forward facing position to kind of laying in my back in the bath which is quite uncomfortable um, and his heart rate came straight mm. back up so she was like okay we can just stay here for a little while um, and everything seemed well again when I think back to this moment I felt like, well, in my head, I said, I want to get out of the bath. But my mum and Luke mm. both told me that I didn't say that. So um, I was like, but I said, I was saying it. I want to get out. I want to get out. But I was just saying it in my head oh, and not out loud. Wow. Because I, it was just so, I, like, my contractions were so close and it was really intense. Um, it wasn't long. It was probably that only makes, another. Yeah. <laughs> that makes me want to cry. Just like thinking that you thought you said it and you didn't and that you had both of them there like saying that you didn't and like that would just oh what a bizarre feeling I know it is it is and like I think like just going back to that moment of like I I feel like I obviously knew something was wrong but I didn't know the intensity of what it would be like I was like something's wrong I need to get out I need to get checked like I knew that um so yeah but his heart rate did come back up um, after that yeah. um, and so then I had another contraction and she checked her heart rate and the heart rate had gone down again and it was quite slow to recover so 
um, she at that point was like, I think we need to get out of the bath. And I was like, good, <laughs> you can get out. Yeah, yeah I've been telling you. <laughs> <laughs> they helped me out of the bath. And I think I had like two contractions on the way out of the bath. So it, it took quite a while as well to get out. I got up on the, um, the bed um, and there was like a, I didn't notice this, but was told later when I got out of the bath, there was like a trickle of blood running down my leg um, as I was walking towards the bed. So I think midwife was kind of like, something's not right. Um, and got another midwife to come in. Um, so then I got on the bed and had a examination, like a vaginal examination. That was my first one um, since I'd been there. Okay. And so I was really, yeah. I was 10 centimeters, so fully dilated. And um, his head was low in my pelvis, but she couldn't actually see it. She could just see my waters hadn't broken and it was kind of bulging. Okay. And so I guess like what had been happening is like my waters were concealing what was going on because it hadn't broken yet. Right. Um, okay. So Shit. Um, I had the CTG on then and um, I had another contraction and in that contraction his heart rate dropped to pretty low um, and was really slow to recover. So the midwife said to me, we're going to have lots of people coming in the room now. Mm. Um, it's about to mm. get really flooded and literally like uh, not even a second there was just people everywhere and obviously I felt really scared of what that was um, and I think like a lot of people have said that though but you still I still don't didn't think you know this is going to end in a baby dying um, no. like this happens no. this is what they're made for this is why we have teams to do these things yeah um and yeah so his heart rate was in the red zone and um, they were like, we need to get baby out now. Um, I got my legs thrown up into stirrups um, with a man's face between my legs and oh, um, vacuum. They tried vacuuming him out, um, but that failed. Uh, so they tried twice with that. And then um, I had an episiotomy and then forceps delivered him. And I just, you know, I just remember thinking, like feeling just like so afraid in that moment where like, you know, there's men head there. They've got these scissors, my, like I'm squeezing Luke's hand. I've just had my eyes shut. Like, Oh my gosh, just get him out. And you know, I, yeah. at that point in time, wasn't having any contractions. So I felt like I can't, I'm failing. Like they're telling me to push and I'm like, I can't push. There's nothing like nothing's helping me. So I was just no. pushing, pushing like, it just was nothing. And they're saying to me, are you having a contraction? You've got to push when you have a contraction. And it was just really stressful. And I was like, but I'm not having any contractions. Once they did the, um, once they put the forceps on, like they were able to get him out really without, without the contractions and just with me pushing into nothing. Um, uh, oh. Yeah. And so in that moment, then they pulled Lawson out, popped him on my chest. It was only like a second. And I could see that he was very blue um, yeah. and floppy and didn't move and his his um, umbilical cord had no blood in it. So one of the things that Luke and I had wanted to do was delayed cord clamping. And so when they got gave Luke the scissors, they're like, quick, cut the cord, because it was obviously an emergency. And... Um, He's like, no, no, we're doing delayed cord cutting. And I'm like, oh, Cut bless the him. Cord. <laughs> <laughs> bless him. He's like, yeah. I know what my wife and I, I wanted. Know. And we're, de yeah, bless I know. him. I love it. I oh, love that he did fuck. that. Um, but then I was like, it's empty. Just mm. cut it. And so he quickly cut it. Oh. Um, and then they took Lawson away straight away to the recess. But I, I still like, um, just try not to get emotional. I have told this story a lot, so I feel like I can detach. But um, when you think about it, like I still mm -hmm. can feel um, the weight of his body, like on my chest, exactly what that felt like in that moment. And the elation of like, I just had, like, I just had my baby. And again, not knowing yeah. what was going to go on, but like that, like I can, I can still vividly picture the sliminess and <laughs> like no, everything that he felt like I in that moment. That. Um, yeah. So um, after that, he was put on the recovery table. So he, we got in there at about 10 
a.m. I think, and he was born at about 12, 20, 5, 20. Wow. I think it was 28 when yep. they said. Um, and he went over to the recess table and there was lots of people around him. At that point in time, I was like to my mum, well, Luke was on the floor at that point because he had like kind of sort of fainted. I don't know if he actually fainted, but the stress of wow. the moment, he's just like, I'm Bless just him. done. And I think oh, like when I looked at my mum and Luke, like I could tell that they were feeling a sense of like relief. Like the baby's out, it's all good now. Like that's the hard part's yeah. over. Yeah, um, and, you, and you were okay. Like I read something beautiful the other day mm. and it was, you know, why did dads feel so tired after mom mm. gives birth? You know, they didn't do anything. And I'm like that poor man stands there and watches so uselessly in a like exactly. he cannot save the love of his life yeah. and the love of the, his life that is about to be born yeah and they like they would he would have been petrified exactly he would have yeah. been, like, like for your for the baby like for Lawson but also for you like yeah and I know totally. I know how much he loves you you know you have yeah. an amazing husband from what I see yeah. and like yeah. I just think you guys are divine and I just think he would have just been mm. totally mortified in, oh. the, in the whole scenario of everything and you're screaming and there's blood and there's a baby and there's people yeah. and there's scissors and it, like that's so traumatic extremely traumatic. traumatic even even if baby survives that's traumatic yes right exactly. you know yeah and that's it like so, I mean, we, we both did a lot of work walk, like walking through that again and in preparation for another birth like going through that together and separately with our counsellors. So, like, yeah, it was something that was really traumatic and we both and my mum, like, we would have dreams and relive it and if we had done things differently mm. and all this, you know, all the things Fire. that you do. Um, so, um, so, so Lawson's on the recess table, Luke's yeah. on the floor. Luke's on the floor. Your mum is looking my relieved. Mom, mom, yeah, my mum's looking relieved. I'm yelling at my mum saying, his name's Lawson, <laughs> go and talk to him. Like, go and be with him oh, on the recess table because yeah. I'm like, He's just got all these strangers around him, like tell him that you're Nan. And so my mum went over. Obviously it was hard because there were so many people, but um, soon Luke followed. Um, and then they, I think they put a CPAP machine, like the breathing thing on him. Um, and there was a little bit of spontaneous um, like respiratory effort from Lawson. So they then decided they would take him to uh, special care nursery yeah um and so you're in a public hospital yeah 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 public hospital um Luke went with him and um, my mum stayed with me which I'm again so grateful that I had my mum there um and I was getting stitched up from the episiotomy during that when I was getting stitched up it felt like I was there forever like it was a really long time and I was like I just want to go I don't want to be here. I want to go see yeah. the baby, like hurry up. And I know yeah. it's probably even longer when you're having, well, it is even longer when you're having a cesarean. <laughs> um, but just that, yeah. like, eagerness I think it's a good like, 45 minutes yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I was probably in that room for another hour 15, probably. Um, yeah. Getting, I got stitched up. Then when I could finally get up, I almost collapsed myself because I needed to eat. Um, and so then I had something to eat quickly then there was blood everywhere mm. so like let's just wash you off I'm like okay um before I had get washed washed off the um, head midwife came in and said like oh like um you know Lawson was hypoxic at birth so meaning there was a lack of oxygen to his brain mm. um and so immediately I just said all these swear words like I'm like okay that's all right though because like, you also because you yeah. work in the industry so exactly. you know yeah exactly. wow and so then I was like but it's all good like he's got the best mum you know mm-hmm. for if he's gonna have a disability and need a wheelchair like I'm his girl like, <laughs> that's Shit. kind of like yeah. how, how could it be more like mm-hmm. what a more perfect scenario mm-hmm. um, yeah so I was definitely like whoa but yeah, fine. Hadn't cried, hadn't really, I wasn't feeling much stress, just that I wanted to be with him and Luke. Um, so then they wheeled me up to, NICU, uh, not NICU or special care, whatever it is. Um, mm. And in that time when he had gotten there, um, they had, I think they did a, I don't know if it was a blood test or like a test on the umbilical cord 
gases. I think you can test that. Um, and okay. they had um, that blood test had shown um, that he had really low pH levels and uh, high lactate levels. And so the pediatrician explained it to us later on as like when you have um, high lactate, it's like when you go for a run and you kind of you get the burning feeling in your muscles, oh, like yeah. they're exhausted okay. and they can't they can't actually move anymore at a certain point. Um, and so uh, his his lactate level. So if there was going to be an adverse reaction, the lactate level is between uh, three and ten, and Lawson's lactate level was seventeen. So it was like well and truly above. Like they want it under three, um, but oh, there's a pretty big difference in that. Um, yeah. And so a pediatrician told us at this later, told us at this point, as soon as he saw the bloods, he was like, how is this baby alive right now? Like, um, wow. like kind of immediately knew that we wouldn't be bringing him home. But in the same breath, he's looking at Lawson and being like, like, you know, he's breathing and he's holding on. And so like, we have to fight for this baby because he's obviously mm. fighting himself. Um, <laughs> And just so beautiful and I'm so grateful that he did hold on. Um, so mm. I think I must have got up to the, the the special care around like maybe 145-ish, so quite a fair bit after he'd been born. Um, yep. And when I got there, he was just um, – Luke was sitting in the corner of the room and his little body was – like far away on a table with a plastic sheet over him. So I was immediately like, what? What's going on? Is mm. he alive? Like, and they're like, no, they're, I think they were warming him up. I don't know. They're doing something. Yeah, okay. warming him with that. Yeah. Um, mm. And I was also kind of like, well, why aren't they doing more? Like surely there's more that they yeah. could be doing at this point in time. Yeah. Um, he was incubated with like a tube down his throat and he had the things in his umbilical cord. Um, and yeah, we sat there like watching them for some time and I uh, have so many regrets about not just like going up and being with Lawson in that moment. I mean, I don't know whether they would have let me, but, um, we sat there, the pediatrician came over to us at some point in time and was like, um, you know, we've called the, uh, the NETS team. So I think it's, um newborn peds something transport team so they okay, like yeah. helicopter yep. um so they wow. told us that the helicopter was on its way to pick up lawson and they were going to take him to somewhere. <sighs> like okay like that's all good and he's like but like things aren't looking good right now and we're just trying to figure out you know what's going on and what we need to do I'm like okay that's okay like keep going um Mm. Think, yeah and then it came to about um and you still at that point at that point I'm sure you were still not thinking death like you're still just oh, like no. okay cerebral palsy brain injury yeah. like we, you know you, you do you're like okay I've got to put a ramp in at home like exactly you're exactly. just thinking of you like you're thinking of all the things I've got to do to bring this baby yeah. home but death is never where your brain goes at no that point. that's like, it definitely yeah. not no. definitely not and yeah. I hadn't crossed my mind. So Luke had been like pretty much crying the whole time. He was just like an absolute mess. So I think like I don't know whether he, whether that was just the, obviously the stress, that's how he was handling it. I was just like, again, brave face. Everything's fine. Like we're going to bring mm. him home. Um, so the um, pediatrician came over and said like, would you like to go and see him at this point? Um like, yes, we would love to. So no one was working on him at that time. The Nets team was probably like 15 minutes away um, from arriving. And so we went over to say hello. So kind of the first time mm. we got to see his face properly because, um, yeah, when he was on my chest, it was just like a blur for a second and then he was gone. Mm. Um, and he was a beautiful, the most little, beautiful mm. red-head ginger, which was that's such right. A yeah. <laughs> such a shock to Luke yeah. and I, because we both have like mousy brown hair, and I mean Luke has a little bit of ginger in his beard, but we were just like we only God knew how much we needed that hair in our life. Um, 
so we were was there is there red somewhere in your family like where does that come from my mum had like strawberry blonde hair as a baby um but no like not really not that we know of like we were trying to track it back to someone and couldn't um but yeah it was really special (laughs) um Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah we went over to see him and we were just you know um stroking his face you know stroking his arms and um I like assume this was for us to say goodbye but I didn't again think that in the moment um and so I was praying and I I think I said the first thing I was like oh hi baby like it's it's mama and as soon as I spoke he his little eyes just struggled to open but he opened them and he held them open for like a split second like one little eye was like a bit closed and the other one was open and then he closed them again and whew, um and yeah a beautiful midwife actually captured just somehow captured that moment so we have that Far. photo of Ugh. and I, I think in I don't know I just felt like he can he can do it like he's he's he wants to be here with us. Like he's trying so hard. And but in the same breath, I was like, if you can't, if you can't do this, yeah. like, it's okay. Yeah. Like, um, yeah, I was like, mommy wants you to be here, but yeah, I know that you might need to go. You're struggling. And, yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. Um, and yeah. we'll be okay. And so we're praying and I was like, come on God, like, We've seen you do miracles before and at the same time I'm saying but I know that you're still a faithful God no matter what happens. So I'm saying this as uh, I'm praying and we're singing like all my pregnancy I had sung like a Christian song that's called Waymaker and every time yeah. I was feeling anxious in my pregnancy I would sing Waymaker, Miracle Worker, even when we don't see it you're working. And so we were singing this over his little body and it was a really beautiful moment and then it was interrupted really quickly because the Nets team were there and so we were like, like, okay, you've got to go sign this thing and sit down and we were like, okay. Um, so that, yeah, I don't know, maybe we got half an hour, maybe 20 minutes of that with him and the Nets team arrived and they were doing a blood transfusion and so they had started the blood transfusion and I could tell as we were watching on that it's not, going well that something had gone wrong with that I don't know like the blood it wasn't the blood transfusion's fault um but I think something to do with the acidity kind of just sent things a bit downhill um yeah and so the pediatrician came over to Luke and I and was like um you know like we're doing everything we can and and we'll keep working on him but there's going to come a point that we'll have to stop working and and we were both like no you can't like he's coming home you have to keep trying like it's like we're trying to stabilize him to send him on the helicopter but we just can't um stabilize him and I think then the the pediatrician turned around and then I heard someone yelling out there's no heartbeat like there's no No. heartbeat and they were doing CPR and then they yelled out time of death blah 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 and we're just sitting there watching it like like is this is this for real like, is this our life? And I just, it didn't feel real. It just felt like so I'm watching on from someone else's story. Like like an out-of-body experience yeah, almost. Exactly. Yeah. And especially with that, like, the yell, which probably wasn't appropriate for her to yell that out, but the yelling out of no heartbeat, watching him have CPR. And time of death. And like, time of what? death. Like, like, yeah. And so it literally felt like a movie. Um, and, again, I still had like I was numb I just felt like I obviously was like what the heck but I still didn't it still didn't feel real to me at this point so Mm. in that moment then Luke's more hysterically crying and I'm rubbing his back and I'm like it's okay it's okay um we had asked to call in our pastor um because they had said we could get a chaplain and we were like can we get our pastor to come in so um she came in and um my um, husband's parents so we'd ask if the grandparents could come my dad lived in yeah. Queensland at the time so unfortunately he couldn't get there quick enough um so my mum was there and, and Luke's parents and we went to this little room um they 
then kept the ventilator on fast so that it could feel like he was breathing still, which was really trippy. And I don't know if I would want that again because I'll, okay. I still then couldn't come to terms with that. He wasn't alive because his his lungs were moving up and down. And so I'm like, he's breathing though. Like he might just come back to life. Like if he comes on my chest and like he feels me, he might just like, you know, this might be the thing yeah. that he needs, which is oh very naive of me. Um, oh, I look I look back at photos and I'm like, how did I not see the sickness yeah. of my child? Like you just, it, it, yeah. it is, you feel like naive, but it's just so much hope. I know, that's, <laughs> it, just, that's it. And you've got to have it. You can't yeah. not. Like right. that's the only reason we you get through because you have this hope. And um, so we were holding him and well, I had him on my chest and my body was so hot, like, I was like, what is going on? Like, I'm I'm sweating. I can just feel like heat radiating out of me. And they were telling me that my body is trying to heat him up because he's so cold. So my body is trying to do its job and heat up its baby. And so it's just this like heartbreaking oh. of, yeah, your, your body's being a mother and doing what it is meant oh. to do when, you know, it doesn't have a baby that it's going to be able to actually care for. And, um, yeah, so... We were with our family and after that we went back to a room and they put us in a birthing suite room up the back, which is for people that have lost a baby. So we weren't thankfully in a maternity ward with other babies crying and I, and we were so far out the back okay. I couldn't hear any women labouring. That's good. Um, and, it, yeah, it was kind of then like, well, like now what? Like I still hadn't cried at that point. I was just like still in shock. Um, they yeah. like changed him, um, like put some clothes on him and he was very um, like stiff and that I definitely looking back at videos can see that I'm emotional in that moment, but I still hadn't yeah, had okay. this like, yeah. like um, my baby's gone guttural, you know, cry moment. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so uh, Luke's brother came to visit at that point and then – we were told we can stay as long as we want or as little as we want. And we were like, okay, we'll stay one night. We'll get our friends to come and visit him tomorrow. And so we kind of started doing the phone calls around to our friends and letting them know. A bunch of our friends had known that things, that he was in the queue or special care and so knew things weren't great, but they didn't mm. know the extent of how bad it was. And again, like we have lots of friends that baby has had, you know, had to go and have heart surgery, surgery immediately or things like that where wow. um, you think yeah. you think it could be really bad, but it's not. And so um, we had to then do the phone calls, which every phone call, um, as you know, would it just takes so much out of you. And one phone call would take so long. And, you know, we had one couple answer and they were like, congratulations mummies like mum and dad and they were so happy for us and then we had to like shatter their hearts as well and that was just so like I'm really glad that they answered it in that way because I'm like we are mum and dad and we do want to be celebrating yeah. but like oh ouch <laughs> like you know, yeah 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 um, <laughs> And, and like you said, you had to shatter theirs as well. Exactly. It's like your heart's breaking and then you've got to break theirs and exactly. then they feel bad because they've just said that and it's just this like, yeah. I, I, and you probably had this as well. We did the, you know, posted on social media about it and then people weren't reading the post and so you'd get, we were still getting text oh. messages like, congratulations, beautiful. Yeah. Like, and it was like, oh my word, <laughs> like we still had, yeah. Oh. Like, and then you're getting parcels arriving because people oh. just knew you had the babies. Then you're getting gifts and you're like, oh. like, congratulations, gifts for the baby. Yeah. And... It's wrong. Yeah. It's, wrong. it's just like it's so constant, hard. constant reminder yeah. and heartbreak. Yeah. That's it. Um, yeah. So uh, then we went to bed. They pulled out like a little bed for Luke and I had the hospital bed. Um, and like, <laughs> I think they offered us something to go to sleep, but I was like, I am exhausted. Like, I'm going to pass out. Like, I'm upset, mm -hmm. but I'm going to pass out. So Lawson was next to us. I think we spent some time cuddling him and taking photos of his toes and bum crack and all the things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. Little that bum crack. We do. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And then we both were exhausted, so we went to sleep. And I woke up at about 
um, 2 a.m. And I just had this, like, overwhelming, like, hit of reality. Like, it just, like, washed Mm. over me. And I went to the toilet and then, you know, I was sore and there was blood everywhere still. Like, I was bleeding and I could barely sit down because of the episiotomy. So my vagina... Sorry, too much information, but my vagina was literally yeah, for black, it. like black. Fuck. So sore. And it went black for a long time down my legs. Like it was pretty intense. Um, oh, and which is just like a constant reminder of the trauma yeah, that your body exactly. went through to get your child out. Yeah. And so I, um, I sat on the toilet and I just lost my crap. Like it was that, that guttural, yeah. like could not breathe like just intense scream crying of like why mm. why and so that obviously woke Luke up and he came mm. in and he's like what's wrong he's like well actually you know I know what's wrong yeah but like like and I think he even said he felt a little bit of relief because he kind of thought I was a bit in denial about what had happened sure. because I hadn't processed it um so then we sat up then pretty much to the morning with Lawson just crying and holding him and singing with him and Luke hopped in the bed with me and we put him next to us and just like a beautiful moment but like a soul crushing like this is what it should have been like but with you alive and you know that um, yeah it's a bit ridiculous um so yeah then the next day um they were doing like some tests on me uh they we invited our life group that was our life group at church at the time Mm. um so a bunch of friends and our family to come and it was just a steady stream of people after like person after person all day long we were planning to go home that night um and so it was person after person and you know Lawson had started uh the night before he like looked quite you know, he still had a little bit of colour in him and his his lips were still, like, pink and uh, by the next day they had started to go quite dark and so, we, you know, warned all our yeah. friends before they came, like, he's not looking as lifely mm. as he was. Um, but they all came and, you know, held him and cuddled him and cuddled us oh, and, I you know, I, I was thinking, like, you know, I when you allow someone to touch your wounds like and your scars like what a beautiful thing that is to invite someone into that space and so I think like if I didn't allow people to hold him to come into that moment to feel the pain and the grief that we were feeling and to see us in that moment and cry with us like Mm. I just don't Mm. think it would have felt real um yeah and like and I feel yeah. like the support of those people becomes deeper 100%. because they felt it with you and they saw yep. it and if they like if there's one regret that I do have and I don't have many but I I do wish uh we no one could hold her until she mm. passed but only Dylan and I were in that room for that last hour and once she passed we really got scared and just left mm. and I wish we spent more time with her once she'd passed and had more people come and have people yeah. hold her and spend more time in that space. Yeah. I really have a lot of regrets around that. Yeah. Um, I can totally understand that. Mm. I think mm, it would, it, and as you yeah. know, it's so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry <go. laughs> when like you start to see their color change and all those things, it's just like, Oh my gosh, I can't, I can't see this. I can't, I, no. you know, it's just this hard, hard to fathom, and we had seen her change colour all. And I think that was mm. where we kind of were like, we had six days with her. And so we mm. were like, we need to get out of this hospital. Oh, and so, totally. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that, that is definitely one regret is. And I remember mm. your message saying like, let your friends hold her and let mm. them feel that heaviness and let them feel that. And I guess, yeah, yeah we, we had, it was a different circumstances. Very but different. I love that you had yeah. that. I love that. Yeah. I love that your friends felt yeah. that. Yeah, I think like you know, it's a very um, an invitation to hold a dead baby or a child that mm. isn't living. It's pretty painful, mm. 
And so mm. our, we are just so grateful to our friend, like the gratitude for them, to them for coming into that moment. Um, it yeah, blows me away. It makes me emotional to think that we have such beautiful community that they would sit there in our mm. grief with us and literally hold mm-hmm. someone that is Oof. not alive. Like that's, it's huge. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I th- and I think yeah like that that is so powerful because I think we probably thought that people wouldn't want to do that maybe mm. I don't know I don't know what we thought at the time but yeah. Dylan and myself ended up going to the funeral home a few days later because we we needed to see her again mm. fully healed and we needed mm-hmm. to see her not in such you know uh, in the way that we left her in the hospital and Dylan's mum came I mm. I said like did you want to come and and hold hold Millie and, and that was I almost choke up now like it was yeah. actually so hard to it was hard to invite somebody to hold mm. my child mm. like that was also a part of it like it's so yeah. beautiful that they got to hold her but also I also didn't want anyone else to touch yeah. her I'm like I don't want anyone else to hold her but I yeah. knew that like and when I asked Dylan's mum too she was like yes like almost screamed it mm. like she wanted to hold her grandchild mm. like and it's like and then at the end of the funeral, my dad came up and was like, oh, do you think I'd be able to see her? And I was like, wow. oh, my word, yeah. And he ended up changing his mind and he didn't. But, I again, yeah. I had this guilt of far out. I didn't even think people might want to yeah. see her. You know, it's just, again, there are the things that I would have done differently um, and things that I, I guess that's probably a regret as well, not offering more people mm. to see her after she'd passed. I just didn't mm. think. Yeah. Oh, I know. And I, but I think for you as well, you have opened up this podcast podcast space, and you're allowing mm-hmm. people into your vulnerability here. And there's actually been studies on, um, like rats done that show, um, like the dopamine level thing that lights up in their brain when you when they meet a new partner, like a new love interest. Mm. Um, it only the only other time it shows up is when they're in like trauma together or doing something dangerous together and so um you know when you allow someone to kind of be in that trauma with you uh, it lights up something special in your brain and creates a connection like between both Mm. brains so I think like particularly with your husband like going through that with Dylan and and allowing each other to be in the trauma together like and allowing each other to feel the feels Uh Like it's, it lights up something in our brain because we're actually designed to do things mm. together. Like we together. are made to be in community. And so, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, wow. then I guess so we, we had everyone come visit. It was so exhausting. Like <laughs> I was just mm-hmm. shattered by the end. And I was like, and I haven't held Lawson. Like everyone else has held him all day long. But, like, I just want time Mm -hmm. with him now. And so we decided we would spend another night and we would just have him pretty much to ourselves the next day. Um, And as lots of people in your podcast have said, that last day of, like, walking away and leaving the baby, your baby, behind and not bringing them home or leaving them with someone else, like, (sighs) it's just unimaginable and... I mm-hmm. guess I just had to remind myself that, like, he actually wasn't there. He was mm. in his new home, which I believe that he was in heaven. And so he's actually, I'm not leaving him in the hospital, I'm leaving him in the arms of Jesus. And mm. a beautiful lady midwife held him as we walked out, which was so lovely. Um, but we walked out, we hysterically cried our way out, not walked out. Um, we had our mums holding us both up as we exited and... Um, had all our friends uh, waiting for us at the um, end of the hospital so like when we came outside and um, we were the same as you and Dylan where we needed noise at home. So they came and had pizza with us until we kicked them yeah. out. More likely we want to go to bed, which was pretty early. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but having that house full of noise because we were so ready to have the baby noise in the house was really important. Yeah. If, we had gone home to silence that would have killed me um yeah the the yeah the missing piece would have been even more noticeable in that moment yeah, absolutely um, um and do you want me to keep going like i can talk about what 
loss and what that ended up yeah. happening. So, yeah, so we'd love, yeah, I'd love that. Yeah, so we had some tests done. We made the, like, hard decision to, um, we decided we would like an autopsy, which, like, makes me feel sick thinking about. Um, but mm. we decided we needed that for, um, like, reassurance for the next baby. Um, and um, they had said that they think something went wrong with the placenta, but they weren't 100% sure that that was it. Okay. Um, we had a meeting with the hospital on our wedding anniversary, so on the 30th of December. So we had a meeting with the hospital on our wedding anniversary. Great way to spend it. Um, mm. And um, they let us know that his placenta was in the um, 10th percentile, I think, um, for um, size, and that is, like, critically small for a baby in a 40-week gestation and a baby that like Lawson was pretty average size so um they were like that is a critically small placenta um the blood flow between me and the placenta was really poor um so they commented on the placenta being like misshapen and it had some things going on because the blood flow was so poor between me um and there was hypercoiling hypercoiling so like say like okay. uh uh the umbilical cord should have you know those blue kind of wrappy lines around it mm. they should have like three within five centimeters maybe i don't know 10 centimeters and mine had like yep. 10 within that so it was really really tight so not much blood was getting from the placenta okay. to the person. <clears throat> and so could a scan have showed any of this or like um, so, well your last scan was at 20 weeks right Yeah, and everything from what they said was normal. They say that normally um, the way that Australia picks up on things with placenta issues is a blood test, and my blood test all came back normal for that. Um, If you look at, like, America's research, like, they are doing something that's called, um, like, measuring the placenta, and so they estimate the placenta's volume by taking a couple of measurements and this guy's made sure. this okay. app that you can put the mm. measurements into and it tells you what the percentile, percentile it is in. Okay. Um, that yep. was not offered. And when I asked my obstetrician about it later, they he laughed at me like, that's stupid. You can't measure your placenta. Oh. Oh. Like, okay, great, okay. cool. Okay. <laughs> cool. Mm. Um, <laughs> and yeah. so is there no other way that they can measure a placenta? Like so – you know, could, could you, so for example, for Banksy's, um, pregnancy, did you mm-hmm. go in? Yeah. Were you able to have reassurance? Sorry, I'm sure you're going to uh, get there, but yeah. No, like, can no, you have no. reassurance that the placenta is fine? Is it a genetic thing? Is it something that could happen reoccurring? Well, when we got the test results back, so it said like, it's their expert opinion that, um, under normal circumstances also there was also a little bit of blood clotting that um showed that it had pulled away so the placenta abrupted it was only a really small abruption like only just pulled Mm -hmm. away and stopped the oxygen for a little bit but um, the expert opinion said that under a normal circumstance um a baby with normal reserve it would have no issue but a baby that has like little reserve like lawson uh then right can't actually function um i think my my um, so that's laptop's that... about to die sorry i'm just going to text luke and say can you bring the charger yeah that's okay sorry no that's all right um, um yes. sorry so, so yeah if that that's if that abruption had have happened yeah but the placenta was normal yeah. there would have been no issue yeah it would yeah, have been a little you. bit of a rush to get him out but it he would have come out okay that's what they expect. And the blood that came out when you were in the bath, was that the yeah. abruption, do you think? Or yeah. What? So when they broke the waters, it was like a bloody colour. So showing that, yeah, the abruption kind of had happened um, and he'd lost too much, mm. I guess, too much blood. I don't know. Um, the other yeah. thing, so to answer your question about, um, like, genetic the other thing mm-hmm. that, that expert said was that um they emphasized that the maternal blood flow to a baby 
is in in that condition is no way related or a fault of mine they actually wrote that in the report it is not yeah. the mother's fault which like mm. I needed to hear that because it was carrying a lot yeah. of guilt around my placenta failing Lawson mm. and like me yeah. the job that like my body is doing failed my baby and so mm. I felt yeah a lot a lot of guilt about that um yeah. and yeah. Do you want to run and get the 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 charger? I might need I to. You're stressing about it. Yeah. I'm like, oh. <laughs> That's okay. Luke, I need the charger. <laughs> this is an unedited podcast, so this little bit's going to be in there. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. I thought it would have been I was fine. Just... No, that's right. I was just talking and I was like, this is an unedited podcast, so that yes. little bit is going to stay in there. <laughs> it's brilliant. No, yeah. it's brilliant. Um, there's there's and- been times where I'm like, Dill, can you close the door? Or I'm like, I need to put the fan on. I love it. On. <laughs> I love it. Uh, um, uh, yeah, he will pop in. Luke's getting it because it's upstairs. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no, I thought okay. it would have been. It's pretty no, good with okay. the battery normally. Um, what I want to um, comment also when you were saying that you guys were singing Waymaker, so that was one mm. of our songs as well, oh, wow. and we played it at Millie's funeral. Wow. Yeah, and every time it comes on, Dylan it's Dylan beautiful. sings it often, and I'm pretty. I'm, he's not much of a Christian worship singer, of course, but he. Um, I'm pretty sure the morning. I have to go back and find that video. In that morning before we went in to have her, he was standing in the lounge room just being silly with his hands in the air and singing, and I'm sure it was Waymaker. That's amazing. Oh, so beautiful. Yeah. It's, um, it's definitely a good song. A good and song. Um, especially when you're feeling like you lack that hope, like it gives you that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I um, yeah. They were talking about the genetic thing. So they, what they told me to do for Banksy's birth or for Banksy's pregnancy was once I found out I had, I was pregnant um, to have a scan and make sure that the baby was in the uterus. And then they said, there's a little bit of evidence that taking aspirin every day can help with blood flow. So that was kind of my, the only thing that they said. Um, and it was enough for me to feel like, okay, I'm doing something different. Yes. Yeah. Like this is different. Um, in the, when I, um, came off the aspirin because you have to come off it at 36 weeks because it's a blood thinner and so if you have a cesarean or something like that obviously you don't want to be on blood thinners and so I came off that at 36 weeks and when I said to the obstetrician who was a different one at that point um just like a a, my obstetrician was off sick and I was just through the public system again um they said um oh oh yeah come off it we don't know if it does anything anyway it probably probably doesn't and I was like, this is the one thing that oh. I'm holding on to, to giving me a lab baby. Yeah. And Far yeah. Out. so yeah, that, that's kind of all they said. It's a, um, I will, I will preface that we're not doctors, but I do know that um, in the IVF world, aspirin is quite commonly mm. used and I don't know why. So people need yeah. to speak to their doctor about that, but aspirin is quite commonly used early in pregnancy for, yeah. I'm not sure what reason, but. And I love my IVF specialist and I love my, he's my surgeon for my endometriosis as well. Mm. And so if he's telling people to take it, I'm going to say it's, you trust it, it's good. Yeah. So I think you did good. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, I got fancy here. So um, yeah. she is here and healthy. So that's what I cared about. And yeah, the other thing, only other thing they said was looking at blood flow in scans through the placenta so I was constantly like please tell me what the blood flow is doing tell me what the blood flow is doing um after that with her um yeah Yeah, because I thought in scans they could they kind of they see the there's like blue and red highlighting stuff and they say oh that's your blood flow or that's your umbilical cord or that's this and okay yeah which was um uh, like all documented as normal at the 20 week scan had I have maybe had a scan at 36 weeks or something maybe it would have been picked up at that point in time. Okay. I guess for me, one of the things that was really hard was that I was like, why didn't Lawson tell me? Like, why didn't you tell me that you were struggling? Like, like, you know, you were having a hard time breathing, but like you kept growing and you were an average size baby. Mm. So you didn't have, you didn't slow down your growth or, you know, you didn't, I didn't notice a reduction in movements. Um, You know, like just those things that I'm like, 
why didn't you make more of a fuss? Like, well, he's mm. just such a polite little boy that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh. So, yeah, that was really, that's yeah. it. And then I guess, yeah, coming to terms with that, like it's not my fault um, and there's nothing mm. that I could have done or known differently to get him yeah. here. Um, and yeah. I think, and I said listening, was it Hannah and Imri that you spoke to that had the placenta abruption recently? Yes. On your podcast, like yeah. listening to her podcast gave me healing in the fact that she did have monitoring constantly and she still mm. had, still lost the baby. And because so, I had, yeah. one of the things was like, well, maybe if you had more monitoring, um, which I did have for Banksy, a lot of monitoring, but like that was always weighing yeah. on my mind. And yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean nothing really equals a live baby all yeah. the time. So, no. Yeah. No. And sadly, um, I had a friend message me the other day and she was like, you're just so strong and you're this and your faith is amazing. And I was like, mm. you know, and we don't feel it in that moment. Of course, you're like, oh, I'm not. Yeah. And, um, I, and I just said to her, um, I feel like God said to me, I need you in this space and I'm so sorry you're going to have to walk this out. Wow. And like that, I just literally said that two days ago. Yeah. And it wow. was like, she just said, whoa. Yeah. Like mm. she's a Christian and she, and, and it was, it was like, God needs us in this space. Mm. And sadly we have to walk it to be there. And um, mm. sometimes I say, God, I don't want to have a big voice. I don't want to be that person, but yeah. we were chosen to be yeah. it and it sucks. Yeah. And Lawson was chosen for that reason as well. Yeah. I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> and Millie was, you know, they're just such powerful mm. little tiny souls that just came here and made this massive mark on the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah. I feel like he's definitely you know, changed and, lots of people, both Millie and Lawson. So they're amazing. Yeah. And, and if it wasn't for Lawson, I wouldn't have known who to reach out to that mm. day, you know, like, so he, he helped us massively now, you know, yeah. he helped us so much by having such amazing parents and you guys <laughs> and you being so, so faithful. Like, honestly, I just remember that. Like, I didn't mm. even know your story. I didn't know how he died. I didn't, all I knew was Danielle was a client in my salon and she was mm. talking about her friends at church that were so faithful and so kind and so gracious and, to just three years later remember mm. that in, a, in an instant it's of amazing. a second and be like I I need that woman you know I need mm. to speak to her I need mm. I need to know how am I gonna breathe <laughs> and so yeah and, and mm. you do you do breathe again you know yeah I don't know how but we, yeah. I'm only six not even not, not even seven months in and I'm I still struggle to breathe some days yeah but... yeah, yeah. <sighs> Tricky. And I think, yeah. sorry, go. So I'd love to ask you um, in terms of autopsy, I know mm -hmm. that's such a, such a challenging decision to make. Are you glad you did it and did you get the answers that you wanted from that? Um, I'm glad we did it, definitely, because it would have been something that I would have questioned a lot, um, even though we did get answers from the placenta, um, but we know that... Um, Lawson was a perfectly healthy baby. Um, the only things that came yeah. back from the autopsy was like a, I think it's called a hematoma on the brain. Mm -hmm. like, so a blood bubble between the scalp and that was uh, caused from the vacuum when they tried to get him out with the vacuum. Yeah. And so they said they're confident that that had nothing to do with his death. Um, and so I think it made me sure. feel like, okay, like, yeah, he was fine. There's nothing else. It's just the placenta mm. issue. Um, that was a thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I do feel glad. As awful and would as they it have is to been think able about. To... Sorry. Yeah. Is the, the, no, that's okay. Sorry. I think there's a bit of a delay. Yeah. Is the placenta, t the testing of the placenta and stuff separate to an autopsy? That might be a really yes. silly question, but. Yes. So they yeah. sent okay. the placenta away and a blood test of, like, the blood of my placenta away to get tested and then Lawson separate. Yeah. Um, but sure. they were able yeah. to give us and the reason both I asked at that the same time. A... Sorry, both results at the same time. Okay, yeah. 
And did it take a long time? Because I know a lot of people say that like, well, there's a lot of talk in Australia at the moment and I'm sure you've seen it. And I think Hannah was actually interviewed last week just after our podcast about the delay and time it's taking to get autopsy results back. Because especially if somebody needs to wait, like, oh, we can't Mm. have another child until we know. Mm. Like, my goodness, that's so much stress. We got our interim results on the 30th of December. So only... Two months wow. later, it was our interim um, results and they said uh, we don't think much would change from this because it was quite straightforward um, and they didn't find anything. And then I think it was like 15 months later or something that we got the mm. final, final results. So at that 30th of December meeting, they gave us the results and then they said um, we're happy for you to start trying for another baby when you feel ready at that December okay. one. Wow. Mm. Wow. That's so big. And so, Mm. and the reason I ask that question is because again, I'm, you know, I'm hoping the podcast is a space for people to learn about, I guess, things that can go on in in Mm. pregnancy and that space and, and hear other stories where they're similar, but also if it's something that in God forbid, three years time, somebody thinks back and goes, oh my gosh, I listened to that. And this girl got an autopsy and she thought this of that decision. And so it's like preparing people for what decisions they could make um totally or or somebody else might be in that space and not know what to do and well I think you know maybe you Mm. could have an autopsy and you might get your results you know knowing it's going to take 15 months but sometimes they come back inconclusive which I know is really hard Mm. for people I know that's really challenging yeah I feel lucky that we have answers for sure yeah and so post um Lawson passing did mm-hmm. you guys have a funeral what was your plans mm. for him afterwards yep so it was COVID um so you were only allowed 10 people at a funeral mm. if you were unvaccinated which I was unvaccinated um and Ugh. so I couldn't have been at the funeral if that was the case um <gasps> and so I we called up around a bunch of funeral homes and said could you organize this and just drop it to an outdoor space and not be there and we'll just organize everything else like you just organize the body here's the people were like no we're not being dodgy (laughs) um but one beautiful company were like don't say anything else we will look after it, but don't say anything like (laughs) you're not talking we're not talking about what yeah just don't tell me the details yeah we yep. will drop him wow. to your funeral service and then whatever happens on site, that's on you. Like, so we had, um, we went to a beautiful tree where um, we got married under. Um, so it's a huge fig tree. Um, and we, we got married under there. And so we decided to have Lawson's funeral under there. And we felt that it was fitting that um, his story started with the uniting of Luke and I in marriage. Mm. And um, so that. Goosebumps. Um, yeah, his and his story. Um, yeah finishes there too and so we had um, Mm. quite it was a pretty small funeral still um, (sighs) there Um, and then we had a celebration service um, at the church where we invited any of the church members um, to be a part of that Um, so that was really beautiful we were really lucky to in COVID still be able to um, remember him and celebrate him Mm. in that way with some loopholes (laughs) Um, that's so good yeah. so good and that's so there should be some loopholes in such yeah, circumstances exactly like, I, I love exactly. that somebody finally said yes for you oh I know that's it even the hospital with letting all our friends in one after the other like that was breaking so many rules but they just did it and they were flipping amazing yeah. so um oh that's just why did. they did the one after the other okay yeah, yeah so a lot of people now. and like yeah it definitely went against their rules but they still let them in so That's great. we're really grateful and I think that yeah, then we just had such amazing support with the funeral we didn't have to lift a finger like you know we just told mm. our friends what we wanted and it was done and it was the most beautiful day um and a most beautiful send-off for him that we could imagine so yeah yeah that's so special and that's such good advice like mm. I was the same we also did nothing and I'm sure mm. most people in that space would just step in and do that but yeah. to have everyone take over and organize the funeral and you not have to even think about much because there's mm-hmm. just question questions you never thought you'd have to answer yeah exactly that's it exactly mm. 
I love that. And so then how long, uh, is, or is there anything else you want to say just in this space in relation to that part? Because I do want to go into yeah. um, conceiving Banksy and then what pregnancy after loss was like for you. And No, I don't think so. I think just, um, yeah, I think like being, I guess like in the space of like being helpful and just like being able to sit with someone in their grief. And I think Lawson has taught me how to be a better person because I feel like I can sit in uncomfortable spaces now and just be like, Mm. just be there. You don't have to say anything and you just need to be present. Um, I think for us, it was like, we just needed people to, um, you know, say his name and, and be around us, show us that they cared, like that it was real. Cause I think if we didn't have that and Mm. I, and in through my support group, I've met a lot of girls that do not have support from their family. They don't talk about their baby. It's like, it didn't happen. And I can't even imagine having that. Yeah. Not having it felt like, feel like such a reality. Like everyone knows Lawson and they know that he's our firstborn and he's a redhead and that we love the mm-hmm. colour orange love hearts and that butterflies remind us of him and so we get sent butterfly pictures of him all the time. Oh, I love that. Um, and, you know, just, just like two days ago a friend posted um, a photo. She's been on a run and there was a butterfly dancing with her and she felt like it was Lawson and she sent it to me and I know that you have the same familiar and so just having that, um, having people to just make you feel like you're not alone, yeah. it's really beautiful. That's kind of all. I love to, that. And can talk about things. When I, <laughs> no, that's okay. But I, and I say to people all the time, like when they're like, I don't know what to say to my friend. And I'm like, ask their name, talk yeah. about them, say you thought of them. Yeah. Like I love, you know, people just send me pink sunsets and mm, pink roses and pink anything. And, or they'll see a business name that's Millie and me or Millie that's and beautiful. this. And, you know, I just constant. Yeah. It's so precious. And you know, like I now know why you did the little orange love heart. So that's going to, I mean, yeah, the <laughs> orange heart. So that's going to be something that's going to prompt me now yeah. for you and Lawson. And I truly believe our babies give messages to other people mm. f- for you to reach out to them. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so often I know that people have baby wren, like the wren birds or they have hummingbirds or whatever, yeah. the, you know, everyone's little messages are. And I just love that. And so, yeah, I think that's yeah. really good advice that, just say the baby's name and reach out mm. and say you're thinking of them and yeah it's so important yeah. and practical help that you guys had I'm sure the church would have done meal mm. trains that would have that's, we a, had that's meals. a standard we had our bills <laughs> paid for like we just had everything oh. cleaning the the community like uh blown away by them and just people just being present you know just Whatever they like, they're such yeah. a big one. Oh, totally. Mm. Because I'm, I'm recovering. Like, come, like, I could barely walk. Um, you know, I, I do want to talk to you about your recovery as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, like I think that was a. I want to talk huge... to you about your postpartum. Yeah. Sorry, think... we have such a no, delay. No. We need <laughs> a delay. <laughs> you go. Just talk. <laughs> My recovery. Um, I guess like it was pretty horrific. Like. I had the, I couldn't sit down. I felt like I couldn't walk. I was also exhausted doing the things like planning a funeral and X, Y, Z. Um, I like in the same breath, you know, you're, you're depleted like physically and emotionally. And so a lot of the days, the same as you've said, like I just stayed in bed. Like I didn't get out of bed. I didn't answer the door. I didn't go anywhere. Um, and then other days I'd feel okay to get up and do that. I think like <sighs> comparing my postpartums, I did have a much better birth with Banksy. Um, but like just that recovery with a baby is so different to recovery without a baby. Like if I had had Lawson, mm. I think those things just wouldn't have even mattered. Um, cause yeah. I know that's the case with Banksy. So yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think, but I, but I think you have a beautiful appreciation now because had you have not experienced what happened with Lawson, you might. And I know that a lot of mums do are like, oh, I had this and they complain about the, and which, and now, like I said before, it's still traumatic, even if mm. your baby lives, but you know, we can, cause I know for me, I was like, I do not want an episiotomy. I do not want yeah. forceps. I do not want any of those things. I didn't even get to have a labor, but you know, those were big, a big deal for me. Yeah. Now, if I had the option, 
give me the episiotomy, give me the forceps and just give me Millie. You've given me yeah. Millie, right? You know, right. it's like oh, all the things we did and didn't want, it just mean nothing anymore. Nothing. Um, yeah. 100%. And I know that I've quoted, I've actually quoted you before saying that I have a friend who says, when I say, you know, I'm sure postpartum with a baby is hard. And you're like, yeah. trust me, postpartum without a baby is harder. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's a different hard as well. It's a, mm. it's a different because you're longing for the hardness that someone else is having. You know, you're longing for that. That's why you have a baby. Like you signed up for it. You know, that's coming. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Mm. Do you want me to talk about Banksy? Yeah. Quickly, I know we don't, yeah, we don't have much time. I don't want to take too no, much that's more okay. of your time. So, um, no, they so can go we, for as long as you want. <laughs> we started, um, I had planned to wait like six months, but when we got the all clear in December, the next, I'd already had my period at that point in time, and the next month I was like, I just want to start trying in case it takes forever. Like, you know, I just want to get, mm-hmm. I just feel like we've got an empty hole in our hearts and um a place to Mm. fill and um not that they would replace but just to fill our broken Mm -hmm. you know hearts and um so we started trying then and we actually fell pregnant that first go which was incredible and also like I didn't realize how much I needed it because when I took the test I realized Mm. how much I really wanted it to happen now. Whereas at the start, I was like, let's just try. And like, hopefully within six months it would happen. I was like, no, I need this now. Um, And we were pregnant and we actually found out we were pregnant on Lawson's three month anniversary. So it was like this bittersweet kind of moment of like, oh my gosh, like, thank you. Um, But like, it felt, we felt a bit guilty to Lawson that like, this meant we were moving on, which it didn't, um, but we've had that guilt. And so we actually went and told our parents both on that day, even though I think I was only three weeks pregnant, um, we were like, we just have to tell them (laughs) um, so that they can like celebrate with us and also cry with us over the three months Mm. without Lawson. Um, And I think like I, so Luke and I had already both had a counsellor that we were seeing before giving birth to Lawson. So he was able to walk us through Lawson you know walk us through that um and we already knew and trusted him and he cried with us and it was beautiful um and so then we Mm. were able to also walk with him through um the pregnancy with Banksy which was really lovely and I also had a um I got a special like birth trauma psychologist as well and I got that with the um, Medicare the 10 Medicare things okay um so I had uh, just to kind of walk through the, the, the things surrounding birth. Um, I think that, you know, the futility of knowing that you have a little, a living baby inside of you today, but that you might not have a baby inside of you tomorrow <sighs> is enough to drive a human absolutely insane. Like about all I knew, I just had, I knew that I just had to have hope and, um, you know, instead of, thinking like I almost felt like I was being mocked by being pregnant like I don't know if that makes sense like mm. like mocked by death or the threat of death was mocking me Far um, and mm. so instead I just had to choose to embrace hope and be brave um and trust that you know like I could do it I could do hard things no matter what the outcome was um and I guess yeah. um yeah like I don't know I do not know how I got through those months but I tried to really separate the pregnancies and tried to make sure that Banksy knew that she was loved and wanted and that I want her to come no matter what even if it's only for three hours again I want her to come and so I I really tried to talk that through and obviously I wanted her to be there longer than three hours but I was like of course yeah you know Lawson dying doesn't make his life any less um, he's still just as important mm. to Luke and I, and he's still our baby. And so I wanted Banksy to know that no matter what, she was important to us. And um, here we found out she was a girl, which was we both knew mm-hmm. pretty much immediately when we got the pregnancy test. We were like, it's a girl. We know we know it's a girl. And yeah. I felt a lot of grief yeah. at first. I was like, oh, like I'm not getting Lawson. I can't, I'm not getting a boy that's going to feel that longing to be a boy mum and so walking through that was Mm. tricky um but 
I got there in the end and we're so grateful to have Thanksy. Um, I ended up having, so I was in high risk care and I had scans every like three weeks, I think it was two or three weeks towards the end um, and everything was all yeah. looking perfect with her, which didn't give me a lot of reassurance um, really. I was like, until she's in my arms. That's what I, that, I know. <laughs> that's what I'm scared of. Like, cause we yeah. were told our whole pregnancy, mm. she's perfect. She's, mm-hmm. Placenta looks great. Fluid looks great. Bub's good. There's her heartbeat. I literally yeah. was told that at every appointment. And so I'm like, I will not have reassurance that she's perfect and yeah. out until I'm holding my exactly. baby. Exactly. Exactly. No, yeah. That's, totally. that's a really, but I love, I love what you've just said. That's so mm. powerful and so beautiful. And and I have thought similar lately, like I'm like, I survived this and I never, ever want to experience it again, but I can survive anything. And so yeah. it's like, what? Yeah. Whoa. Ugh, I don't even want yeah. to think about it. But no, I, like, know, I know. That's I heavy. Know. Um, I think, yeah, just having hope that I would hold my baby, that the bassinet will be slept in, that, you know, Lawson will get to hand mm. his things down to his little sister. And, yeah. um, and so we end up getting induced at 39 weeks. Um, and that was just a recommendation that they made and I didn't question it. I was like, yep, whatever, do what you think. And we got induced. Um, and I had, first of all, they just broke my waters and, um, they wanted to see what happened. Nothing really happened. Like I had a little bit of contractions, but it was nothing much. Um, and then they were like, let's start the drip. So they put it on a really, really low dose of the drip. And when um, they did that, I was like, oh, I, the contractions. So I was in the same hospital as well, um, but I had asked oh. for a room that was facing a different way. I had asked for the bath to be covered. I came in early and I decked it out with photos and music and other things that were different. Um, and, yeah, I did a lot of work to, like, kind of get to the point that I could birth in the same hospital. Um, and yep. so... Yeah, so then at about when they'd started the induction drip, I was like, I can't do this. Like, this is, like, so triggering. Like, I don't think I can do it anymore. And I was just about to ask for a cesarean, which was, like, I was open to doing that. Like, I don't think I can go through this anymore. I'm like, and I don't know what to do. And the midwife said, why don't you just lay down for a little bit? And this was before I'd, I think I'd said to Luke, I don't know if I want to do this. Um, and she'd said, why don't you lay down? Like things are going quite slow at the moment. Just lay down and, and have a rest. I'm like, okay. So I laid down on the bed. As soon as I laid down, I was like, I do not like this position. Like this is not fun. And I was laying on my side. So they came and put a peanut ball between my legs. And then I was like, no, 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 I'm pushing. She's coming like right now. And I legit pushed twice. And she came out, <laughs> put her on my chest screaming. And, <laughs> and it was the most beautiful, heart wrenching, you know, moment of just <sighs> joy and elation and thankfulness that, yeah, filled every broken part and also made me feel and close what an to Lawson. absolute. What an absolute legend of a daughter to be like, you know what? I know my mum can't handle the next 10 or 12 hours of this. So I'm just going to go now. Like that's just her being like, I got to mum. Yeah. My active labor is recorded as like 30 seconds or something like that on the thing. Like, I'm like, oh, that's amazing. I don't know that the next baby would be like that, but (laughs) we can hope. Mm. Yeah. And so you felt... Like, yeah, like obviously just so much relief I can only Mm. imagine. But then, yeah, so you're saying you felt closer to Lawson in that moment? Yeah, I think like I realised that she could never replace him and that um, Mm. like he always will have that piece of my heart that, you know, of course a baby brings joy Mm. but it doesn't replace Mm. the fact that we miss him. And so I think that made me feel really close to him because it kind of brought me back to that that hurting again. Um, But also then I'm like, this is your sister, like, you know, we get to teach yeah. her about you and, like, talk about you and keep you more alive in our family home. And I think, you know, for me, I guess I am waiting in expectation to see my son again in heaven. But mm-hmm. I'm, I'm also on earth knowing and getting to know and love and delight in my daughter. And so there's always going to be this tug 
on my heart. But, mm. you know, yeah, having her here and having him there in that moment, it just it just felt so beautiful to me to yeah, feel connected to them both somehow. Like, again, another out-of-body. And out I think of body. it's beautiful. Yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. And I think it's beautiful that in that moment I feel what you're explaining is that she didn't replace Lawson and I mm. think that's a beautiful feeling because I know that people say like you know that that baby's not going to replace them and but you'd have a little bit of fear of like am I going to forget about them or and sometimes when you're not hurting you're like does that mean I don't love them or am I forgetting yes, about totally. them so to, for Banksy yeah. to remind you like I'm here but I'm not replacing my brother and yeah. he's just another part of you know an element to it and th- yeah that's really beautiful yeah she's the best <laughs> She's the no, best. I love seeing your posts. Yeah, she's special and she definitely knows that Lawson's the baby in the pictures and she always wants to point at it and carry his photos around and we do little, um, like instead of butterfly kisses, we do um, Lawson kisses because he reminds her of the butterflies. So I ask her if she wants a Lawson kiss and she puts her eyes right up to me and blinks and it's just so beautiful. So she helps Lawson feel alive in our lives every moment of the day, which... I just couldn't ask for anything. And how old is how old is Banksy? She, she like a year is and a half? yeah, almost sixteen months. And so, at what? Because I think this is super beautiful and powerful as well. And I know the girls at, at coffee the other day were saying like, when do we or how mm. do we talk about our children mm. that are not here to our living children now, especially if they're young? Um at what point did you start mm. talking about loss and to Banksy? Like I'm sure I feel like it's just a natural progression that mm. really will always be spoken about from yeah. the second our baby is born. And yeah. when did Banksy start to like Yeah, I started acknowledge. the same talking about Lawson from get-go and I would say our prayers at night and we would um, thank God that heaven is real to us and that Lawson is there mm. um and so just like speaking his name a lot um and I guess we started like we showed her photos it probably has only been in the last like month that she kind of like I said um oh look where's Lawson and she went and got that the photo and then went and got uh, one of her little baby dolls and was holding the baby oh. doll and going shh, shh, shh. and so like I, she still doesn't understand and it definitely doesn't yeah. understand that he's the brother or, you know, that kind of thing, but she knows mm. his name. And so I think we just can continue yeah. to, she's interested in looking at photos of him. She loves looking at photos of him. Um, and so I just think we just yeah. keep doing that and keeping him alive. And hopefully one day we'll get to um, explain it to her a little bit more. I am nervous for what that, what, yeah. how that will go and how to like make sure yeah. I do it well as a parent, but um, it's beautiful. I think, I think, um, even as an adult, it's hard to talk about, but I think mm. the fact that I, I have to believe in heaven to mm. know that I'm going to see my daughter again. Yeah. And I think that is a super powerful part of it. And I, I had a lady when we we're in Mexico, in all kindness, went to debate me on heaven. And I was like, please don't. <laughs> not, I'm not the person to debate on this. Not like I, I have to yeah believe that I'm going to see her again and so I think it's just such a beautiful um thing to have that belief if anything or you know and so that's how I think I would be explaining it um and I know people talk about them being in the stars or being in the rain or being in the clouds or being where wherever and all of those things are just so precious and I'm sure Mm. whichever way it's meant to come out it will yeah I know there's so many resources like little you know books for people to read for their kids and but I just think having them around the house and having their photos and kids are so intuitive like they they are feel them and see them and play with them and yeah Yeah, they really are they really are it's beautiful oh it has been so nice to hear your entire story sorry I I talked like it just (laughs) no I love it I I the our podcasts go generally between an hour to two hours. And I remember when yeah. I first started, Dylan's like, don't, don't go longer than 50 minutes. Cause people won't <laughs> listen to them. And I'm like, so I remember the first one I did like two 50 minute ones. And then I was like, okay. And then the next one went for like two and a half hours. Yeah. And I walked out and Dylan's like, no one's going to listen to that. 
And they did. And so now I like show him, yeah. show him the listens and I'm yeah. like, bro, you don't know. That's it. I know. Well, because there's just so much that yeah. you could say. Like I could talk forever. <laughs> but Of yeah. course. And yeah. that's what I always say. Like there's nothing off limits. And, mm. and I said to him when, you know, when he was saying all of that because he was such a podcast expert, I just yeah. said to him, I said, I'm never going to stop someone mid-story and be like, okay, that's it. Mm. It's just not, no. you know. Um, Yes, and that's what I say at the beginning of it, like this is your story and you tell it in as much depth as you want and whichever yeah. way and you, you did amazing. Awesome. Thank you for letting me share, Rochelle. Appreciate it. You are so welcome. Um, if there's any, like, resources or anything that you want to send through, um, your yeah. podcast is actually going to be out this Sunday because okay. we've, we're, we're so up. up to date with everything. Yay. But, um, yeah, good. I love yeah. that. I love that we talked about everything in so much detail. I yeah. loved, you know, um, postpartum with a baby, postpartum without a baby, mm. vaginal births, going back mm. to the same hospital, doing the work you did to go to be able to birth in the same mm. hospital. That's super powerful because mm. a lot of people don't have a choice to go to another hospital. Yeah. So, like, knowing that, um, you know, you did the work, which I assume yeah. was, you know, with that. Um, grief counsellor yeah. and your birth trauma counsellor and, yeah. and you and Luke doing counselling together and doing it separately they're all phenomenal yeah. things that have obviously got you guys in a space that yeah. you're in now yeah 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 it's beautiful and I think if I could just say if there's anyone on the central coast that wants to be a part of um, Hannah and my support group we would love to have you we know how daunting it is to um, come and be a part yeah. of something like that but we also know how healing it has been for everyone in the group to um, share stories with people that just get it and um, yeah just have that community which is so important and vital for us all so everyone is welcome <laughs> absolutely and I am so glad as well and that I met you guys in person the other day mm. because I so Stephanie I'm interviewing next week she's Sage's mom and she was mm. really scared to come she's like oh I just don't know what to expect and I said yeah. imagine having coffee with six girlfriends but you've all lost babies and so there's yeah. nothing off limits yeah you know and she said oh but I'm still so scared I'm gonna say the wrong thing and then it was so beautiful to see her there having coffee and being vulnerable and emotional and opening up and it's just yeah. this it is the safest space like yeah. nothing is off limits and yeah I know I said something to one of the girls who had lost twins there was um there was identical twin loss and then there was a what's the other one called uh, fraternal, fraternal. Yeah. and I made I made a comment that I would have t taken offense to yeah. the way I said it. And then I apologized to the mom. I said, I'm so sorry. So Sky, I said, I'm so sorry. I just said that that was really insensitive. She goes, Oh no, of course not. And it's just like, yeah, we just, it's just beautiful. It's I just a so really too. beautiful. Yeah. I loved it. I loved it. And I loved hearing about everyone else's babies and everyone hearing about Millie. And, mm, yeah. Special. Yeah. You, you guys yeah. are awesome. Thanks, Rochelle. Thank you for yes. having me. Thank you again. You're awesome. so welcome and I hope to see you again in face-to-face -face soon for a big cuddle. Yes, that sounds great. Awesome. All right, bye. Thanks, lovely. See ya. Bye. Bye. bye.